Good morning, everybody. Today is the last episode of Kubernetes 101. It's been a really fun journey with everybody over the last few months. And be sure to watch to the end of today's episode for a special deal that I'll talk about then. But today we're going to talk about monitoring Kubernetes. Before we do that, go ahead, like all these episodes begin, I enjoy uh, one of the things I do enjoy a lot about these live streams is the fact that I can interact at least mildly with uh, with people in live chat, depending on how involved I am in the actual thing that's going on in the demonstration. Uh, but seeing where everybody's from is always uh, always great to see just because it's amazing the, the global uh, reach of, of something like Kubernetes and this educational material can do. Um, and it's also nice to see just where everybody else is from uh, who's watching this. And uh, um, what's really surprised me comparing this series to the Ansible series that I did earlier last year is there's so many more people from outside the US and Europe uh, compared to the other series. So it's it's just interesting to see the growth of Kubernetes around the globe. Um, anyways, uh, we'll get right into it. Um, you can see I was just bringing up my mini cube cluster here. Um, today, we're going to talk about monitoring things. In episode six, we actually talked about monitoring logs in Drupal a little bit. I didn't get too deep into it then, and I talked about Elasticsearch and Kibana and things. I even had a video talking about the company Elastic and some of the open source decision, decisions they've made recently. Um, but we didn't get too deep into it then, and we're not going to go deep into logging today. We're going to talk about some other things. Um, but some people would maybe begin their Kubernetes journey talking about some of the things that I'll be talking about today, especially the Lens app. Um, I typically don't like learning new tools using an abstraction layer or a UI for it. When I learned Git, I learned the command line first, and then I added some, some GUIs on top of it after I understood the basic concepts. That's the way that I learn, and I, I think a lot of people would learn the architecture better and would learn how a tool actually works better if they use the primitives or the, the things like the command line utility or the, the primary mode of interaction instead of throwing an abstraction layer on top. Um, but that being said, we are human and uh, we have our monkey brains that can't really wrap themselves around something that doesn't have a UI layer or something that doesn't have a visualization to represent something that's more uh, complicated and complex underneath. So it is it is nice to have visualizations and it is nice to be able to browse a cluster using a tool instead of just thinking in your head, oh, I know it's the kubectl, whatever. Um, memorizing hundreds of command line tools is something that we all have to do because of what we do in our jobs. Uh, but it's not necessarily the most fun thing, especially, you know, if, if there's more obscure things that you don't do all the time, having a tool to help you with those is great. Uh, so today we're first going to talk about the Lens IDE. It's called an interactive development environment. And I guess you could call it that. I, I generally think of it more as a cluster browser with some advanced features that let you interact with the browser, interact with clusters, and not a, an IDE because I actually do my development work in a code editor or a real IDE. I don't I don't manage resources individually in Kubernetes clusters. That's that's not using infrastructure as code in my opinion. That's managing infrastructure like you would in Amazon's UI that's uh, in the console. That's okay to do technically, but if you're really focusing on infrastructure as code, you should be managing your infrastructure in code, pushing that code up to like a Git repository, and then that's where it deploys from, not clicking an edit button in your cluster and changing a resource that way. And the second thing we're going to talk about is what I call the de facto standard for all metrics monitoring in Kubernetes. There are so many different options, and we've talked about the CNCF landscape before, but this is the, the tool that is most often used to gather metrics about your Kubernetes clusters. So it'll be good to, uh, to, really, know, um, <clears throat> to really know how it works and, and how to integrate it with your cluster. We're not going to go super deep. Remember, this is Kubernetes 101. I'm not going to talk about building custom metrics and and managing uh, a Prometheus cluster outside your Kubernetes cluster or anything like that, uh, but we will talk about it. And finally, we're going to talk about Grafana, uh, which is really the easiest open source way to manage alerting and monitoring dashboards for your cluster. And uh, to, to test these things out, I actually have two clusters. Um, I set up two different clusters. 
One is my mini cube cluster that you saw that I had up at the beginning of this episode. And I, I also have, if I go to cloud.lino.com, I, I reset up the cluster that we had from episodes uh, four, five, and six. So I have this episode 10 cluster. It's running Drupal. It has Ingress. It has a uh, cert manager running on it. And you can, I'll show you that site. It's still up at ep6.cube101.jeffkeerling.com. And that's running, I think, Drupal 9, 9.1 or 9.0 or something like that. Anyway, this is a Drupal website that's running in this Kubernetes cluster. And uh, and so I have those two clusters. And the first thing that I want to do is uh, take a look at what these clusters look like through Lens. And Lens is a, it's a good name. I have to give them credit. It's it's a good name for a, uh, a tool that lets you see into a cluster. Um, I'm a photographer also, so I'm, I'm used to lenses and I know a good lens is worth its weight in gold in terms of giving you a good rendition of what you're trying to image. And, and lenses, it, it, at least it's my favorite way to see my Kubernetes clusters. Um, but and the real reason that something like lens is important and helpful is for most of us, once you get finished learning a little bit about Kubernetes and you start building a cluster, you realize you might need two clusters, a dev and a prod, or you might need three clusters, a dev to stage and prod, or you might have like a cluster for one client, a cluster for another client, a cluster for another client. You end up having a lot of clusters and kubectl is not really efficient for dealing with multiple clusters. You can write some command line wrappers and there are some utilities out there for dealing with cluster contexts and things. Um, but it's just not super efficient. And most of us don't want to sit there and, and configure a command line utility to try to give us all those contexts because we already are dealing with the same thing in Git repositories and things. Um, so uh, it, it can be annoying to use kubectl with multiple clusters. And also another thing about kubectl is it is a very complex command line interface. There are so many different parts to it. I often have to look up references for how to do things like creating a local proxy to a service and, and things like that. Uh, you know, there is good documentation in the man pages for it, uh, but it can be sometimes difficult to remember how to do something. So Lens, Lens makes both of those things very easy. Uh, and a little history on Lens. First, I'll go to the website here. A little history about it is it was originally made by Contenta. That's spelled with a K. Uh, but in early 2020, so just last year, Mirantis, who has been consuming a lot of different cool Kubernetes tools, uh, they acquired Contenta. They didn't acquire Lens yet. So they actually did that late in 2020. Uh, but the good thing is that this tool is, is managed under the MIT license. So uh, like many other open source tools, if they ever try pulling a, um, an elastic and flipping the license on you, uh, it, it could be forked very easily and it, it would be because it's such a nice tool and, and many people use it. Um, so I don't think we're, they're going to pull the rug out from under us and, and change any licensing after acquiring this because it's such a good tool. And uh, I think it's kind of like one of those Halo tools where it's like, oh, Mirantis manages this. Oh, they must be good or something. Um, but anyway, so the, Mirantis owns the uh, owns the, the structure around Lens, but it's an open source tool that's free to use. You can download it from this website and install it on uh, Lindo, uh, Windows, Windows, Mac, or Linux. Uh, but on on my on my Mac, I usually manage things with Homebrew. Um, so when I wanted to install it, I just ran brew install dash dash cask lens, and that popped it onto my computer. Uh, it can also be installed with Snap if you love Snap. I don't love Snap um, if you're on Linux. Uh, but anyway, once you have it installed. Uh, you can just open it and it'll come up and ask you to add clusters. And just like with kubectl on the command line, the way that it connects to your clusters is through a, uh, uh, a cube config file. So I'm going to add, well, it already has the, the, the main cube config file added. This is the one for minikube. And if I set the minikube context here and say add cluster, it should connect to the running Minikube cluster locally and start showing me everything about it. So it's showing me some warnings from events that are happening on the network. If I go to uh, workloads, it's going to let me browse the pods in the cluster. Uh, I don't have anything running on this local cluster, but it will let me browse these pods and things. 
Um, and uh, so, so that's kind of cool. This particular cluster isn't doing a whole lot. So, you know, we're, we're going to add the Linode cluster because it has more stuff going on in it. It's running Drupal and all that. So I'll go ahead and do that. And that cluster config, I think it's linode.yaml. So I'm going to add that one in. And I'm going to add uh, uh, the Linode context that's in that cube config file. Uh, add cluster. And what it does initially is it just gets from the Kubernetes API all the resources that are in the cluster so it can list it here. And it keeps updating this as, as things go along. Uh, so it, it's a live updating dashboard of everything. So if we go to pods, this is showing pods from everywhere in all namespaces. If I want, I can limit the namespace to Drupal that we saw in, in episodes four, five, and six, uh, which Drupal currently has uh, a Drupal container and a MariaDB container. It also gives you a lot of nice things at a glance showing how long it's been running, uh, how it's controlled. So it's through a replica set that's created by uh, deployment. If we go to deployments, you can see Drupal here. Um, and it gives you uh, a little at-a-glance indicator of if the pods are healthy, if they're not, how many containers are running in the pod. This was an init container that sets up the files for Drupal. Um, so all this stuff is great. You can click on a container and it shows you all the information, just like if you ran kubectl describe the resource. This is all that information in a nice formatted uh, list. But here's where some of the things uh, get really interesting with uh, Lens you can get logs, live updating logs, by just clicking on that little, this little icon up here, logs. And you can even get logs for ended, like uh, containers that are completed, the init files container, uh, things like that. Um, so that's kind of cool. And you, you can browse different containers also by switching in this little selector. Um, I haven't found a way that you can merge all the logs for one entire deployment, like all the pods in one deployment together. Uh, but you can browse individual container logs this way. Um, uh, so that's really cool. Another thing that's nice is uh, you can bring up a an active kubectl session for this cluster. So generally on the command line, if I want to switch to my, my uh, Linode cluster, right now if I say minikube, or if I say kubectl get nodes, I'm going to be looking at the default, uh, the default cluster that's in minikube that's in my kube.cube config file. But if I wanted to switch, I'd say export cube config equals uh, .cube slash linode. And then I could say kubectl get nodes. And now I'm in the linode context. And here you can just switch contexts by clicking on the different clusters. But if you want to use kubectl, you can just hit plus down here and say terminal session. And this drops me right into the right context already. So if I say kubectl get nodes, it gives me that output uh, for the Linode cluster. And if I just switch over here and do the same thing, and I say kubectl get nodes, I'm in the minikube context. So that's, again, switching between clusters is, is very quick and easy inside of Lens. Now, there's some other cool features, and one of them is going to probably surprise some of the viewers of this. Um, so I'm on the Linode cluster right now, and uh, I, sometimes it's nice to be able to dive into a pod to debug something. And a lot of pods have a command line environment, like a, a shell like bash or just plain sh or something, so that you can log into the container and run around inside of it, look at files, look at logs if you don't have the logs coming out to Kubernetes correctly, um, change, change things in that container. Obviously, any changes you make in a container, unless it's in a persistent folder uh, in a PVC, those changes won't persist, but it's nice to be able to debug sometimes by logging in. So if I click on this Drupal pod, there's a button up here for pod shell. And that's going to drop me straight into the pod. And I can start looking in this container, logged in through Linode, through my computer, through the cluster, and uh, see files on it and uh, see, see what's going on in the pod. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Now, another thing, and this is the part that might really surprise some people, is I can go to my nodes. So these are the three Linode servers. And uh, you'll notice that this, this, little, this little shell thing is here for the node too. And if I click on it, it's going to drop me in as root on my Linode node. And to prove that, I'll do ps aux and show you. Here's all the things running. You have container D running as a service. This, this drops me in as a root user on the node. And um, 
I have in my notes here, wait, what? Uh, some people are surprised when they learn that if you give somebody admin access to a Kubernetes cluster, you're effectively giving them root access to the servers where Kubernetes is running, at least in most Kubernetes configurations and the way that Kubernetes is, is installed in most places. And how is this possible? Well, it's this is containers. This is the way that they're set up. Uh, Kubernetes runs as root on the server, and you can run containers using Kubernetes using the privileged, privileged flag, which allows you basically to run the container in the root namespace on the server itself. So you can log into the server as root. Uh, the, the, way that, um, the way that Lens actually does this is it starts a pod with privileged and it runs the command nsenter-t1-m-u-i-n. And that basically says, give me all privileges and all rights as root on the system. Um, so something that something that you might want to take a look at if if you are involved in security at all and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize this. I need to take away admin access from intern Jim or or the uh, the new developer we just onboarded that that uh, is doing PHP apps and should have no business getting root access to our servers. Um, Pod security policies, which I'm not going to go into today. That's, you know, security could be its own entire 10 part series on Kubernetes. Uh, but you want to look at pod security policies and preventing people from creating pods that can, uh, that can do things. Also, the other thing is a lot of people, when they start using Kubernetes, if someone else needs access to the cluster, they just share the cube config. That's not a good idea. Um, other people will just create a new account and, like in Amazon EKS, add everybody as a system master. Uh, and that's that's also not a good idea. You, you need to use Kubernetes uh, role-based access controls to add user accounts that have fewer privileges so that it can't do things like this. Uh, if I had a lower privileged account, I wouldn't be able to create this pod that can get root access on the server. Um, so anyway, I, I wanted to mention that because that's one thing that a lot of people run into once they start getting deeper into Kubernetes. Oops, we just created a pod that gives everyone running this pod root access to the server, or this PHP app all of a sudden can have root access to the server. That's a bad thing. Uh, so you do need to, to keep that in mind, um, especially if you're building automation tools, like if you're using Jenkins with Kubernetes or some other service with Kubernetes and you give that access to your cluster, you have to understand that you're giving that app full root access and full control over your entire cluster. So be really careful, I guess, at a, at a minimum. <laughs> and ideally limit the control th that that app can have by using role-based access controls. Um, all right, so another thing that's really cool about Lens, though, besides the fact that you can get root on your servers, is uh, if you wanted to drop into any web, web app or web service that's running, if I go to Network and go to Services, you can do this using, um, using uh, let's see... Uh, or any other service. Um, you can do this using um, uh, using kubectl with uh, what is the command, like get uh, local proxy or something. I forget what the command is. Again, I look these things up all the time because I forget. Uh, but in Lens, anything that's running that has an exposed port, uh, you can go into and like, let's see here, I can click on one of these ports and it will create that proxy for me and open it up. So Nginx is saying 404 not found because it doesn't have an ingress record for localhost. Um, but anything that's in here, it gives you a link in the port section in the services, and you can just click on it to bring it up. Um, I don't know if there's anything inside of here that, that might be interesting to see. Uh, no, not really. But if there were, that'd be cool. I guess Kubernetes has the API, so if I click here, I don't even know what it's going to bring up. <laughs> um, but that is nice because you just you don't have to remember the command line arguments to get into the service that's running uh, if it's not exposed through a node port or something else. Yeah, it's it's not going to do that because Kubernetes is a special service. Um, so that's kind of cool. Another thing is, and this is where I, I talked about earlier, it's called an IDE for Kubernetes. But again, I, I don't like doing this because this I don't think this is a great way to manage your clusters. You should be managing them through code, not through an interface like this. Uh, but if you wanted to, if I wanted to, uh, let's go to the Drupal deployment down here. Uh, if I wanted to scale up Drupal, I could just click on this edit button and I could change it in here. 
uh, to replicas three or five or whatever. I could do that. Um, and it's the same thing as saying kubectl edit on the command line. Uh, but typically, unless you're doing some active development on that resource and doing some testing and things on a local cluster, typically you want to do all these kind of changes in your code and not, not be doing them directly on the cluster like this. Uh, but it is nice to see, it, you know, if you just wanted to see the, the configuration or grab, uh, grab the spec out and copy it into a file or something, you can do that here. Uh, so I'm going to cancel that. Um, but one thing that you might also be noticing is, it, as I'm browsing through, there's a lot of messages on the screen about metrics not being available. And even if I go to the cluster level, uh, it shows metrics are not available due to missing or invalid Prometheus configuration. Now this cluster does have, um, if I go to the terminal, this cluster does have metrics. So if I say kubectl top nodes, uh, it has the metric server running on it. And metric server gives metrics for nodes and pods and things. And that's also useful for kubectl get hpa dash n drupal. Uh, we have that horizontal pod auto scaling configuration that will scale Drupal if needed. Um, but uh, Lens actually doesn't use metric server to get its metrics. It uses Prometheus. So that's a good segue into getting Prometheus running on our cluster. Uh, so a little bit of background on Prometheus. Uh, and Grafana, first of all, with Prometheus, it was actually developed by SoundCloud. There's a lot of these tools in the Kubernetes ecosystems where somebody actually developed it for a purpose they had, and then they donated it to the CNCF, and, and Prometheus is one of the prime examples of this. Uh, SoundCloud was having some trouble growing their stats and metrics uh, monitoring systems. They were using StatsD and Graphite, I think. Uh, but in 2012, they started building this new tool, Prometheus, to make it so that they would have a faster and simpler backend for managing metrics and pushing them out from servers to a central location. Uh, this tool started to be really popular. They, they put it open source and, and other companies started using it. And uh, SoundCloud realized, hey, we could, you know, we could share this and make it official. So in 2016, they actually transferred the governance of the Prometheus project over to the CNCF. And uh, in 2018, Prometheus became the second graduated project in, in the entire Kubernetes uh, cloud native ecosystem. And uh, that's a pretty significant milestone because graduated means this is a tool that's used extraordinarily widely. Uh, it's very stable, it, it's very uh, robust, and it has a very good structure of development and maintenance and things like that. So um, like I said, it's pretty much the de facto way of, of managing metrics inside of Kubernetes. Um, Grafana, on the other hand, uh, and, and I, I guess I could show the, the actual websites for these things, uh, Prometheus.io. Uh, so there's Prometheus. Now, in Prometheus and Grafana both don't have to be run inside a Kubernetes cluster. That's not the only way you can run them, uh, but they're, they're great inside of Kubernetes. So that's, what, that's the context we're going to talk about them in. Um, uh, Grafana is actually managed by a company called Grafana Labs. And they have uh, a hosted version of Grafana, and they, you know they have a software as a service platform, but they also publish it open source under a free license. And so that's the way that most people that use it inside of Kubernetes will use it. Um, an interesting part of the history of, somebody's here from Mars, I, I seriously doubt that. Um, <clears throat> and his name is Gandalf, so I guess I have fictional characters in live chat now. Um, uh, but Grafana was actually forked from Kibana 3. And the idea was Kibana was, was already a, a pretty nice visualization tool, but it was a bit complex, and it also didn't focus on real-time metrics monitoring. It was focused more on uh, search graphs and things like that. So uh, the, original, the original idea was to fork Kibana 3 and make it a little simpler to use and make it focused more on individual metrics and live updating monitoring dashboards. Uh, so <laughs> over time, uh, things like plugins were added, and uh, and the the plugin repository was was extraordinarily huge. Uh, and and nowadays you can find an integration with almost any tool that you want, whether it's getting uh, getting stats and metrics from Amazon or Google Cloud or whatever, uh, or bare metal systems or uh, integrating notifications and alerts with Slack and Teams and IRC and PagerDuty or pretty much whatever software you can think of. Um, <clears throat> but um, 
the other nice thing about Grafana is it, it works with a lot of different systems, it, not just Prometheus as a data source. So you can build dashboards that pull in data and metrics from all over the place and build really awesome dashboards that update in real time for any kind of data that you want, whether it's in your cluster or business metrics or other things like that. So a lot of people use Grafana for all these different things. And, uh, and I've, I've been using it for the past couple of years now and really enjoy the fact that it's open source, simple, and just works really well. Um, <clears throat> so in the past, it, originally it was kind of hard to get all these things working together because each of these programs is a little bit complicated and has its own little quirks and, and ways of configuring them and things like that, especially when you go into Kubernetes. There's a lot of uh, config maps that you'd have to set up to connect the two together. And the first time you do it, it can be a little daunting. Luckily for us, there's a project, the Cube Prometheus Stack. And this is a Helm chart that's maintained in the community that uh, actually integrates a project from the Prometheus project called Cube Prometheus. And this, this does a few different things. <clears throat> it, installs, it installs Prometheus and Grafana on your cluster, but it also installs a few other things that are helpful to have, like uh, Cube State Metrics, which helps um, pull metrics out of Kubernetes and put them into Prometheus. The Prometheus node exporter, which grabs node, uh, node metrics from your, your actual Kubernetes nodes and puts them into Prometheus. <clears throat> and uh, uh, a few default Grafana dashboards that are really helpful for Kubernetes debugging and monitoring, as well as some Prometheus rules and things like that. <clears throat> so, you could, if you wanted to, go to the Cube Prometheus project and install using that. Uh, it actually has a set of manifests that you can install. And for some clusters, I actually do that when I need to modify things and, and customize them a little bit more. But for most clusters, the Cube Prometheus stack has a great starting point, And in some cases, it's all I really need, uh, especially if I'm not doing any custom application monitoring that I, that I need to set up later. Um, <clears throat> so to get this running, just like any other Helm chart, first we need to add the repo. So I'm going to do that here. Uh, so I'm going to, and I could do this in Lens too. It, it doesn't really matter where I do it, but I'm already in the context of the Linode cluster on the command line here, and the font size is a little bigger, and I, I don't want to look up how to do that in there. So the first thing to do is add the Prometheus Community Helm Charts repo. So I'm going to do that, and it's already in here. And it's always a good idea after adding a repo to run Helm repo update. So making sure that all my repos are up to date. And then I'm going to I'm going to put this into a monitoring namespace. That way it's separated out from the rest of my cluster. And uh, generally it's a good idea, as we've seen with Drupal and, and other things, to put things into their own namespace. That way you have a little more control over the way that it's set up and managed. Uh, and finally, I'm going to deploy it by installing uh, installing Prometheus, that's what I'll call this. I could call it like monitoring stack or something, but I'm going to call it Prometheus inside the monitoring namespace. And this is the, the actual Helm chart that I'm going to install that comes from the Prometheus community chart repository. So I'll do that. This is going to take a little time. Uh, and, and once that's done, I can, I can watch the, the progress of it. I can actually check in Lens. And this, this is cool because Lens is all uh, real time. I can check in Lens in the monitoring uh, namespace what's going on. Right now it's not seeing any pods in here. Uh, but if I go to deployments, I think, uh, still nothing there. It's still installing. Uh, we'll see when things start populating. And we'll see it come in. Um, should only take, OK, so here comes, here comes some pods. Uh, it looks like Grafana and Prometheus monitoring, and uh, I guess this this is the node exporter running on each node as a daemon set. Um, so again, Lens is nice for seeing this kind of up-to-date stuff. You can do this all on the command line, and I, I have been through the rest of the series. And like I said, I think you need to know how to do that stuff so you know where this information is coming from. Uh, but it is nice to have this in Lens so we can see things coming up. Uh, but it looks like everything's running there. And if I check the deployments in the monitoring namespace, uh, everything looks like it's available. Uh, so that's cool. And, um, and the next thing I want to do is access Grafana. Actually, be before that, I'll show you really quick just what, uh, 
what Prometheus itself looks like. And I can't resize this column, so I don't know what these are. <laughs> uh, there's probably some way to resize the columns here, but I'll just try to make the window larger. Prometheus, Prometheus node exporter, alert manager, here, Prometheus. Uh, so let's open this up. And this should just show us the Prometheus dashboard. Uh, and it opened on my other screen. So hold on a second. Let me bring this over here. Uh, this is the Prometheus dashboard. And this is not, uh, this is probably not the most like, oh, this is intuitive. Uh, <laughs> you have to know what you're looking for. You have to kind of know what, what Prometheus, uh, how, how it's set up and things. So uh, this is why we use Grafana, because it's a little bit nicer in terms of the interface for interacting with the data in the cluster. Um, but you can see here's the rules that are added by this stack automatically. If you didn't have the stack setting these up, you'd have to set up a lot of the stuff yourself. So you can see why it's nice to have this community maintained stack that does all this stuff. Um, but it's showing that everything's OK, which means that Prometheus is getting these metrics and they're getting into Prometheus and Prometheus is storing them successfully. Uh, so we could look up all these different things inside of Prometheus itself. And that's an exercise that I leave up to you, the viewer, to do on your own time. Um, because we're going to look at Grafana instead. And uh, there's a few different ways that we can get at Grafana. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is we can check and see in the command line. I'll do it here just because we've been doing that and we should be pretty familiar with it by this point. If I get the services that the stack sets up, we can see there's one for Grafana. And it has a cluster IP, so it's not accessible outside the cluster right now. Uh, but uh, the same kind of thing that we did here, if, if I clicked on this, it would set up a proxy for me uh, so I could go to it locally. But we can do the same thing on the command line with kubectl port forward dash n monitoring uh, service slash Prometheus Grafana. And we'll do port 3000 to port 80 uh, so that we can get the access to this Grafana running on there. And now it, it sets up that port forward. So if I go in here and go to localhost uh, 3000, this is going to load Grafana for me. And uh, the the actual the, the admin password for Grafana is set up by default, and it's not very secure. So if, if you're going to do this on production, you probably don't want to use the default password. That's a bad idea. Um, default passwords are always bad. Uh, but the default username is admin, and the default password is, what is it, prom? prom dash operator and you can actually see what it is uh, grafana has that i'm going to cancel this so now my proxy is gone um, but you can actually get the get the password through a secret that's stored in the monitoring namespace uh, the secret's name is prometheus grafana and i'm going to look at the admin password inside that secret and again you can you can do this stuff through lens too it's in where are the secrets storage no Apps. Uh, where are secrets in here? I don't know. That's a good question. I've never looked up a secret inside of uh, inside of Lens, so I don't know where where those are. They have to be somewhere. Uh, <laughs> out of the box, Grafana is admin admin, even more secure. Yeah. It, it, so the the point here is that if you're going to do this in production, you should definitely. Uh, not use the default admin password. And that's a value that you can override in the, the chart that you install. Um, it's under configuration. Oh, the, the one thing I didn't expand. There they are. All right, so if we look at secrets in the monitoring namespace, you can see Prometheus Grafana is in here. And this is the admin password. And this is base64 encoded. So if we do that, it decodes it for us. And you see prom operator, which is the same thing as doing this command on the command line. But you can see, like, you know, if, if you want to get this quickly, trying to remember all this is a lot harder than clicking through here and finding this. But it's important to know how this works. So, you, you know, this little button here is masking the fact that it's decoding in Base64. If you don't know that, then this is just going to be magic and mystery to you. Uh, so that's why I always start on the command line before I go into these utilities. Um, all right. So... But, you know, going to localhost 3000 is, is not wonderful. And something like Grafana is typically something you'd want to expose to other users of your application so that they can monitor your systems too. Grafana has a user access control system that you can set up. And uh, 
So I actually have an ingress record that's just like the one that we used for Drupal earlier. Uh, and it's going to use the same thing. It's going to use Nginx for ingress, and it's going to use uh, the, the cert manager to get a Let's Encrypt certificate. And I can deploy this, and it's just saying instead of, you know, for, for the other one, it was Drupal. Dot, or it was ep6.cube101.jeffgarland.com. Um, for this one, it's going to be grafana.cube101, or we could do monitoring.cube101, whatever we wanted. And uh, I have this domain name pointed at the ingress uh, load balancer in Linode already. So all I have to do is deploy this. So I can say kubectl, well, let's see, uh, Kate's manifest, kubectl apply dash f grafana. And it's going to apply that. And after a minute or so, this should be accessible. And technically, you could go to it too if you wanted. And I'm sure some of you already are. Uh, so you can see it already has a certificate. Uh, the certificate is from Let's Encrypt, so it's all all verified and happy. And if I say admin and uh, what was it again? Uh, prom dash operator is the current password. So now I'm in the Grafana dashboards. Now, it, it, like I said, it, this this comes with a bunch of out of the box stuff that's really nice already. So if, if I go to this little dashboards page and manage, you can see the dashboards that it comes with. Um, and there's a lot of really neat ones. Uh, for for example, if you just want to get an overview of how your how your nodes are doing, if any of them are are like overheating <laughs> or have too much uh, CPU usage or anything, you can go here and browse the different nodes and and see memory consumption, CPU usage. I think these are all uh, two virtual CPU uh, nodes, so you can see there's there's a graph for each of the virtual CPUs, the load average, memory usage, disk I/O, network I/O, uh, things like that. Um, some of the other nice dashboards that you might want to look at is the general, well, let me go back to this view. Excuse me, the general uh, cluster overview here that's showing uh, CPU usage across the entire cluster. So obviously this cluster is a bit oversized for the one application that I'm running, but I, I'm sure if, if somebody wanted to throw some load at Drupal, the CPU util utilization would probably go up a bit. Uh, but you can see also a nice overview of uh, the quotas and the usage for each namespace. And th this is another reason why it's good to define for every application that you put out there, uh, CPU requests and CPU limits. That lets you see at a glance in a dashboard like this, is this application using all of its CPU? Do I need to consider increasing the allocations I get to it? Or you know, is this application doing something bad and thrashing or something? So you can see that Drupal it's not really using much at all right now, probably because nobody's accessing it. Um, let's see. Uh, I was just checking live chat for a second. Uh, so that's another another helpful dashboard that you can use to, to get a glance. Um, I don't want to save any changes there. Uh, the other one that I like to look at is uh, workloads. And um, if you go in here, you can see um, Let's see, you can change namespaces and see different things that are running, uh, what their CPU usage is. It's just a little easier than going on the whole cluster level to get that uh, to pop in here. But these dashboards are all created inside of Grafana, and then they were exported into a config map. And you can change anything uh, just by going in here, and you could change the actual query. Um, you can change the way that this is displayed. Um, you know, take out the lines and use bar graph. It, it's a pretty simple interface. It, there's a lot of complexity here, for sure. Um, uh, but once you get the hang of it, you can create any kind of dashboard that you've ever seen, uh, You know, whether it's a cool hacker's dashboard from a movie or a TV show like Mr. Robot, or uh, a dashboard. <laughs> you can, I can see somebody must be doing something. MariaDB is going a little bit crazy right now. Um, uh, but you can do all this stuff easily once, once you get the hang of it. Uh, so that is that's Grafana's graphs. It'll be interesting to see if uh, if we go to where's the cluster compute resources cluster. CPU usage has been increasing a bit. Uh, Drupal's still not doing a whole lot, but uh, it, it looks like somebody's probably doing a little bit of work hitting Drupal. So thanks for that. Um, but Grafana, like I mentioned earlier, has a user a, a built-in user user access system. So if I go in here. Uh, you can add more users. You can have users in different teams that have access to different dashboards. So it's nice for that. Um, 
But what that what that also says is Grafana, just like Drupal, is a stateful application. So these things are stored in somewhere uh, on a file system. So if you are going to do that, if you're going to set up Grafana and have different users and, and different access and things like that, you're going to want to also set up persistence, which is not enabled by default. So that's something that trips some people up. They set all this stuff up and then they upgrade their nodes and their cluster or something, and then all their configuration is wiped out, all their custom dashboards. That's because you have to turn on persistence. <clears throat> There's a setting in the Grafana chart. Uh, let's see, Grafana Helm chart. Um, it's called persistence.enabled, I think. Uh, it should be in here. Uh, persistence. Yeah, so persistence enabled is set to false by default. So you wanna actually turn that on by setting it to true if you're gonna use this in production. And then you also wanna do things like back up that volume and uh, make sure you have a process for restoring it if there is a failure. Um, anyways, so uh, you know, today we talked about Lens, Prometheus, Grafana. Uh, it's, if you have these metrics in place and, and you know, it looks like, uh, it, let's, let's check out how, how Drupal's doing over here in cluster. Um, it's not a whole lot of a lot a lot of load, but um, if you have these things in place, you can start seeing like what applications do need more CPU or memory, or, or if your servers are constantly running out of RAM but they have lots of CPU, maybe you need to switch the server type that you're running on. And with Kubernetes, these things are a lot easier because you can swap out servers and, and replace nodes very very quickly and efficiently. Especially if you have a system that's more redundant and has has the ability to to move to different servers. Um, in this case, MariaDB would have a little downtime when it moves to a new server when you do an upgrade or a server replacement. But when you have these tools in place, it's easier to see capacity issues or if you're over provisioned, things like that. If you don't have these tools, it's harder to see that and you have to do a lot of manual work. Um, and Lens can save you a lot of time just, you know, instead of remembering the command line arguments to get this secret and to, to base64 decode this to see that it's prom dash operator. All those little things can save a lot of time, but again, I like to learn the hard way and then, you know, throw on a, a tool like this on top of it. Um, but it, just like with Kubernetes itself, I would I would caution against diving straight into Lens and doing everything via Lens because this can be a little daunting too to see all these different options. You know, when when you click on when you click on a pod and you click on this, there's so much stuff going on in here that until you know what all this stuff is doing. This is going to confuse you too, um, but it is an, it is interesting to see that now uh, now that we have Prometheus set up, we can see all these stats uh, for individual pods as we click on them. And uh, let's go over to Drupal and see see if Drupal's also yeah we're seeing a little bit more activity here uh, and a little bit more network activity. So somebody somebody's definitely been um, been pulling down Drupal a little bit, but it's it's running pretty well on this cluster, so that's good. Um, anyways, so uh, before I get, uh, that, that's all I have to talk about for monitoring today, but before I get to the, the thing that I teased about in the beginning of this episode, um, I wanted to thank everybody who has been watching this series and, and uh, you know, as an infrastructure guy, I always monitor all the things I do, including my YouTube stuff that I do, uh, like this series. So it was as I've mentioned at the beginning of every episode, I love seeing the global audience this has. And this is a map. It's not exactly accurate in terms of the depth of the colors, the darkness of the blue and things like that. Um, that was a little bit hard to get because there are some people who repeatedly say every episode, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, or I'm from wherever. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see, like almost all of Europe has had people viewing this. There's a ton of people in South America um, Asia, in, in the Ansible 101 series, I didn't see as much uh, in terms of Asian countries that were represented. Uh, so that's cool to see. Um, and, so, uh, you know, South America, there, there were a lot more people. Africa, there's, there's uh, it was about the same with, with Ansible 101. Um, so probably not quite as much penetration of infrastructure work there. Um, but it's always encouraging to see more people coming from there. And, and Russia, too, this time, there were more... Uh, more Russian viewers for this series than, than I ever expected. Uh, so that was cool. And <laughs> USA, USA, USA. Yeah, obviously I'm American, I speak English. And so 
probably the, the most people are coming from more English oriented countries like USA, Canada, Great Britain, and, and some of the European countries. But um, I'm so happy to be, be with all of you. And uh, there are some other metrics that are interesting to share. Uh, this, this, I think, just shows uh, something that, that YouTube's algorithm uh, does. Whenever I've done a series, I've done about four or five different series on this YouTube channel, and always, for some reason, it only recommends that first episode. And so you get a ton of people watching the first episode. You get a number of people who kind of follow along to the second, but then they lose interest by the third if they're not really invested in learning about Kubernetes. They're just kind of interested in the idea. Um, so, you know, with, with any of these series, it, it always has a graph that's like this. Uh, but I, I also found it interesting that my operators episode was the least viewed. Um, episode nine is, is still only a week old. So, you know, I, I discount that. That'll, that'll keep going up. Uh, but for some reason, people just weren't that interested in operators. Um, I, I really like them, but uh, they, they are a little bit more complicated. And maybe that's a topic I should have left out and done in a Kubernetes 102 series. But, um, but it is what it is. And uh, uh, I'm still amazed by the numbers that, that this uh, series has produced. Um, and I, I actually have a blog post. If you go to jeffgeeling.com, uh, you can find out more, uh, more about um, all these numbers and what they mean in, in comparisons to my other series that I on, did on Ansible. Uh, but one thing that, that I should note is the, uh, the revenue I get from these streams, including the sponsorship. And I, I have to say thank you again uh, to, to Amazie for sponsoring this. Amazie.io has, uh, has been very generous and, and made it a lot more worth my while than this number uh, makes it seem. Uh, but if you take all the hours that I put into making these episodes versus the money that I get out of them, it's, it's not much. Uh, and, and so I guess my advice for anybody who would be thinking about doing this themselves is don't quit your day job and do this. Uh, this YouTube channel has been, I've had it since 2006 or seven or something. And I, I really started trying to grow it a, a year or two ago. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of investment, and you're not going to see a huge return on investment. Um, in, in the blog post, I even mentioned uh, a few ideas that I had, like maybe doing this course in a system like Pluralsight or Udemy or something. But I decided to do it in the open and free because that's, you know, that's who I am. I like to, to make my content open and free. Um, anyways, so... Uh, early on in the series, I think it was episode one or two, I mentioned that I was selling Ansible for Kubernetes, which I'm still writing and I'm still going to finish. Uh, I'm, I'm giving it to you for $4.99 for all the viewers of this series. Um, but uh, I decided, this was about a week ago, I just decided to take all the content from this series and put it into its own book that's more focused only on Kubernetes, not on automation of Kubernetes, but learning Kubernetes itself. And I decided to make that book free I love these little animations. I'm sure Steve Jobs spent years working on that little anvil drop animation. Uh, but I decided to make this book free for everybody watching the series. So if you're watching this, there will be a link, uh, which is right here. If you go to that link, you can get a copy free. And yeah, if you want, you can share that link with other people on social media and things. But I figured I'd do this special for the people that are actually watching this. The book is an extraordinarily raw form right now. Uh, a lot of the book is actually transcripts from the videos that I have not edited much yet. Uh, so I'm going to be working on this, making it a lot more useful. But the book already has almost all the content from the series in it. It's just in a form where I still need to go through and edit. And every chapter I have a little warning at the top that says, I haven't finished editing this chapter yet. Um, so, so, but please go and get this. It's only free for a couple days and it's only free for the people watching this series, uh, kind of as a thank you for watching. Um, go get it because if you get it from LeanPub, where, where this link leads you to, you'll get every update to the book free forever. And for anybody that's that's bought um, my Ansible for DevOps or Ansible for Kubernetes books knows, I, I continue updating them and I keep them relevant over time. So uh, it's, in my opinion, free is definitely the best value here. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, and, and like I said, please go ahead and share that. If, if you know somebody else who would benefit from this, share it with them as well. And since I'm making this free, since I'm, uh, since I'm um, keeping, uh, you know, not, not really getting back a ton of money for the, the hours I'm putting into this and stuff, if you do feel like you would be able to do it, I would greatly appreciate if you'd consider supporting me on Patreon or GitHub sponsors, and there are links in the description below. 
Um, but anyway, please check out the book. Uh, know that it's still in rough form and I'm working on it, but uh, over the next few weeks, I should have a lot more of it uh, completed so that, that it's a more useful reference. And for people like me, I know um, I like having a book in my hands. I'm going to be publishing a paperback version soon uh, once I get, once I get the, the book in a more final form. So anyway, I will see you on the internet. Thank you so much for watching this series. Um, it's been a blast, and uh, I will see you next time.